Hola a todos, soy Javier Poveda y esto es de Bien TV, el canal donde te lo vas a pasar de bien mientras aprendes geografía, historia, historia del arte, economía y empresariales. Este vídeo va dirigido a mis alumnos de primero de la ESO sección C. Y. Encinar Torrelodones. In this video, we're going to study almost the last, or well, maybe the last unit of this course, which is Ancient Rome, probably the best unit of all the year. But since we don't have <laughs> enough time, it's going to be a little short, a little only. So let's jump into it, to the presentation of Ancient Rome with this wonderful picture of Ancient Rome. So, the Roman civilization, that is what we are going to study, was founded, of course, in the city of Rome, which is in the middle or in the center part of the Italian peninsula. Rome originally was an agricultural village situated on the Palatine Hill, in La Colina del Palatino. Rome was founded in seven or around seven hills, and the most important one was the Palatine Hill, on the banks of the river Tiber, a orillas del río Tiber. And it expanded across the seven hills and surrounded by a protective wall. And, and at that time, it's when we have to consider it a city. It was founded by the Latins, because the region of Rome is called the Latium, el Lazio. Por eso el equipo de fútbol se llama la Lazio. Which was a people from, or a civilization from the center of the Italian peninsula, and um, they shared this Italian peninsula, the Latins, with some other civilizations, and the most important one was, or were, the Etruscans, of course, the Latins and the Greeks. Remember when we studied the Greeks in the south of the Italian peninsula, there were colonies, Greek colonies, the Magna Grecia. So this is how it looked like, okay? Here, Latini, and these were the Italics, here the Etruscans, and here in green in Sicily and the south of the Italian peninsula, the Greeks, the Greek colonies. And this is the map of uh, the wall of an ancient Rome with the seven hills. And the central hill is the Palatine Hill, called Palatinus, que eh, is the, the hill, the Palatine Hill, el Palatino, de donde estaba el palacio. Por eso se llama así, el, los palacios. Palatium. And in the banks of the, in the eastern bank of the river Tiber. And um, probably, uh, well, this is how uh, probably the Rome was founded, but there is a legend, of course, a mythological legend, and in this legend there were two children, two boys, Romulus and Remus, they were the twin sons of Mars and descendants of Aeneas, the Aeneas, which was a Trojan who had fled after the Trojan War from the city and sailed to the Italian peninsula. And as the governor of the region feared they might take his throne because they had these um, ancestors, these, uh, for example, the god, they were put into a basket and thrown into the river Tiber. This is very similar to the tale of Moses in the Bible. And the current carried them to the bottom of the Palatine Hill and they were rescued and raised by a sea wolf, una loba, la luperca. This one? And when they were adults, uh, they founded, they decided to found a new city in the place where the sea wolf had, they had rescued them from, um, from the river. And they had an argument and Romulus killed Remus and he became the first king of Rome. Okay, this is la, la Luperca, okay, the sea wolf who raised them, Romulus and Remus here. And this is the argument they had why they, while they were building the city and Romulus stabbed Remus and killed him. So, in Rome we have three main periods of history. The monarchy, the republic and the empire. We have to know all the dates. Rome was founded, according to the legend, in the year 753 BC, on April the 21st. And the first period was the monarchy, because Rome was ruled by seven kings. These ones, Romulus, Numa Pompilius, Tullus Hostilius, Ancus Marcius, Tarquin the Elder, Servius Tullius, and Tarquin the Proud, or Tarquinio el Soberbio. And after that, 
the last king of Rome, this Tarquinius, was deposed in the year 509 BC and the Republic started. In this Republic, the power was passed to the Senate, which was an assembly of nobles, of patricians. Okay, and we, eh, and we have to know these dates. Remember, 753 BC, the founding of Rome, and then first the monarchy until the year 509 BC, when the Republic started. In this Republic, Republic is known because, uh, well, like this, well, it's a political system in which power is held by a person elected by the citizens and for a limited period of time, in the case of Rome, for a year. And this term, this word, republic, comes from res publica, public affair, la cosa publica, es lo que quiere decir res publica. And this means that, that the power did not reside with a king, with, with an only single person, but with the people and the senate of Rome. In fact, Rome was uh, usually named with this letters S P Q R in Latin Senatus Populusque Romanus El Senado y el Pueblo de Roma the Senate and the People of Rome and this is Lucius Junius Brutus which is the first consul or he's known to be the first consul of the Roman Republic this republic started in 509 BC and ended with the empire in the year 27 BC. And we have to know these dates, remember. So, in the Republic, the political power was shared among various institutions. And just like uh, we studied in Greece with Athens and Sparta, we have to know about these institutions. Maybe the most important one was the Senate, an assembly which dealt with the most important matters. Mostly, the foreign policy and they advised the magistrates. The magistrates are the churches in the government and they were elected, elected for a year, politicians who govern and were responsible for different duties. We have a lot of magistrates and the most important ones were the consuls, they were two consuls, two, who held military power, the praetors, los pretores, who administered civil justice and governed the provinces, they were the governors of the provinces, the uh, political divisions of the Republic and the Empire, the aediles, los ediles, who were in charge of the cities, of the government of the cities, and the quaestors, los cuestores, which were in charge of the treasury, of their collection of taxes, for example. And finally, the legislative assemblies, they were Three of them were people's assemblies which voted for the laws and elected these magistrates. They were called the comitia, los comicios. So this is a, a diagram of all the institutions. The Senate, the ancient Rome governing and advisory assembly, because the Senate existed during the monarchy. They advised the consuls, which were the most important magistrates elected every year. Then we have the public assemblies, the Comitia Alonso de Conquilium Plebis, la Asamblea de la Plebe, which elected the Tribunus Plebis, el Tribuno de la Plebe. But the most important officers, officers or magistrates were censors, praetors, aediles, and quaestors. I think I didn't... Oh... The, th the censors are not here. Well, the censors were responsible for maintaining the census, the count of the citizens. Okay, and, and this is, for example, the Senate, where the patricians, the privileged, were uh, where where they gathered. And this is Kikero and Catiline in the Senate. And this is Octavian, also in the Senate, giving a speech. The first emperor, Caius Julius Caesar Octavianus. But we will talk about it later. So, the social conflicts. There were a lot of social conflicts within the Roman society because there was a conflict between the rich minority, the patricians, los patricios, who held all the political power at first, and the rest of the, the citizens, the common people, called the plebeians, los plebeyos, who lived modestly and did not have so much political rights. And because of this inequality, there was a lot of social 
conflicts. And the plebeians uh, gained very slowly their political rights. They fought for their political rights and they win some of them between the 5th and the 3rd centuries. The most important one is that they managed to create their own assembly, the plebe Conquilium Plebis or the Plebeian Assembly, that elected this Plebeian Tribune. They, the Plebeian Tribune could represent it the plebeians and increase also their political rights. They could access, finally, in, since the 4th century, to the magistrate's positions. One consul was plebeian since the 4th century and all other social rights. For example, the abolition of slavery for accu accumulating debts. If you remember, this is something that happened in the first civilization in Mesopotamia, in Egypt and also in Greece. These are patricians, these are plebeians and these are slaves and a legionary. So, <clears throat> how did the uh, Republic end? Uh, because of the inability of this Republic to resolve these social conflicts. And as a result, more and more power was held by the generals, by the consuls and later the proconsuls and so on. The most famous military is Julius Caesar, Cayo Julio Caesar, es Dios. And he went into a civil war, he defeated his enemies, mainly Pompey the Great, Pompeius Magnus, and form a dictatorship. A dictatorship happened in the Roman Republic when there was only one consul. And this happened in very exceptional times, mostly at war times. This happened or this lasted until the year 44 BC, when Julius Caesar was assassinated by his senators in the chamber of the Senate. And the heirs of uh, Caesar pursued, persecuted their uh, assassins, and the heir was Octavian. He was his great nephew and also named adoptive son. And also Mark Antony, which was one of his military leaders. But once they had defeated the assassins of Caesar, they went themselves into their own civil war between Octavian and Mark Antony. Mark Antony had allied, had allied with uh, Cleopatra, for example, and he was defeated in the Battle of Actium, and Octavian had all the absolute power. This is Julius Caesar. And with the absolute power of Octavian, the empire started. Here you have Caesar, who was the general that conquered the Gaul for the Roman Republic. This is Caesar being stabbed by all of his senators, and here you have the scene of the assassination of Julius Caesar from the magnific um, TV series from the HBO or by the HBO Rome. I don't want to show this here, and this is a bit violent. So, how did Roman Rome expanded? They, oops, no, it expanded first, starting in Rome, they conquered Italy and later they expanded to Hispania, Africa, C uh, Corsica, uh, Sardinia, Sicily, part of Greece. Later they controlled Hispania, Greece and part of Asia. Then most of the uh, southern half of Europe, Egypt and Africa. And finally the last conquest of the Romans were Britannia, Retia, Ladacia. Uh, well, the, the Asia, which is Romania and these parts of Asia. The most important wars that the Romans faced were the Punic Wars, Las Guerras Punicas, conflict between the Romans and the Carthaginians. The Romans called the Carthaginians Phoenici, Phoenicians, and from that word Punic, Punicos. They were, uh, they were located in the north of Ag Africa, mainly in the city of Carthage, Carthago. And there were three Punic Wars, or Punic Wars, not Panic Wars. The first Punic War from 264 to 241 BC, Rome, the three wars, wars were, um, were won by the Romans. Rome occupied Sicily, Corsica and Sardinia that, that were previously Carthaginian territory and the most important one, the Second Punic War, starting 218 until 201 BC, 
de Cataguinian general Hannibal, Hannibal Barca, he invaded the Italian peninsula from the Iberian peninsula. He went you know, on a land route to the uh, Italian peninsula. He threatened itself the city of Rome with his elephants. However, they were defeated by a counter invasion in North Africa that forced him to return to Carthage. And he was defeated there by Scipio Africanus, Scipion Africano in the Battle of Zama, or Zama, como se diga en inglés, in the year 202 BC. After that, the Romans imposed their rule over the Carthaginians Again, they gained the territory of Hispania and the Carthaginians had to pay them a, a ransom. Finally, at the Third Punic War between 149 and 146 BC, the city of Carthage, Carthage was finally destroyed and salt was spread all over it. A ver, la rueda del ratón. Okay, this is the Second Punic War. This is the, uh, well, the second and the first Punic Wars, okay? And in the second Punic War, this red line is the route of Hannibal. He attacked Saguntum, Sagunto, que está en Valencia, okay? And he went uh, through the Pyrenees and the Alps and invaded the Italian peninsula and defeated the Romans four times in a row with this magnificent Battle of Cannae, Cannas in the year 216, one of the best battles of history. This is how ancient Carthage looked like in the north of Africa, a very big city, and this is Hannibal crossing the Alps with his elephants. And how did or how Rome managed to expand all over the Mediterranean? Because they had the best army, hands down, of all the ancient times. This army was called the Legion. It consisted of various legions and its legion was the legions were commanded by the consuls. Remember this magistrate. The generals were the consuls. Its legions had about uh, 5,000 soldiers with 300 cavalry units and some auxiliary troops provided by Rome's allies. They weren't Romans and they lived in these camps Okay, that were somehow these very small cities. In fact, many of these uh, Roman camps later developed into cities. For, for example, El León, aquí en España. Okay, this is, these are the remains of the Roman camps, as you can see with the Cardus and the Decumanus and the wall. And this is how the Roman legionaries in the time of the Republic looked like. I have this short and this is how they looked like in the time of the empire. And this is the famous Testudo formation to protect themselves from the arrows of the enemy. And if you want to know how they fought, here you have a video from the... What is this? <coughs> you have a video from the, this uh, movie, The Eagle, Las Águilas. And another video from the series TV series Rome. So the last period of the history of Rome is the Empire, the Roman Empire, starting on 27 BC until the the, the end of the Western Roman em the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD. AD means Anno Domini después de Cristo. Quiere decir AD. So, in 27 BC, the Senate, after the Octavian victory over Mark Antony, was awarded with the title of Augustus, the Venerable, and Imperator, the military leader. And this marks the beginning of the Roman Empire with Octavian as the first emperor. The emperor in the Roman Empire held the absolute power, both religious and political. He made the laws he wanted, he appointed the magistrates he wanted, and the governors he wanted. And even though the republican institutions were still alive, they had no power. And these emperors usually pass their title down to their children, okay, as like if they were kings, although this wasn't mandatory. And since this procedure of succession was not 
clear. So that this means that the son of the emperor wouldn't be necessarily the next emperor. There were many, many conflicts and many emperors were assassinated and usually or many times were assassinated by the own personal guard of the emperor, which is called the Praetorian Guard, la Guardia Praetoriana, la famosa Guardia Praetoriana. So the emperor held all the political power, consul, the legislative and executive, all the religious power. He was the Pontifex Maximus, the first religious authority, the judicial power. He could, he could judge all the processes and, of course, the military power. He was the leader of the army because he was the imperator. So we have two sub periods in the empire, the height of the empire and the lower part of the empire. The, during the first and the second centuries AD Anno Domini, Rome experienced its most prosperous period and reached its maximum size. In the first century, they conquered Britannia, Britannia, which is Great Britain, and in the beginning of the second century, Mesopotamia and the Dacia, which is Romania. Nowadays, during Trajan's rule, which was from Hispania, by the way. And this period is known as Pax Romana, La Paz Romana, because of the stability and prosperity the Romans enjoyed in this period. But in the third century, the empire started its decline, both political and economical. Why? Or an economic. Why? Because the barbarians, the foreigners, the Romans also called the foreigners barbarians, from mostly the north of Europe, the Germanic tribes attacked the boundaries, the borders, the frontiers of the empire. And this came at the same time of um, many and constant political crises, be crisis, because the emperors were not able to stay in power for long. They, in this third century, the rule of the emperors lasted sometimes a few months, and the generals used the army to serve their own political ambitions. The army could set a new emperor, could, could proclaim, and they did many times, they appointed new emperors. So they were civil wars, many during during most of this third century, and they brought an end to the peace of the empire. So this is the maximum extent of the Roman period in the year 117 AD during Trajan's rule, when they conquered Ladacia here, which is Romania, and Mesopotamia here even though it, this conquest, well, the conquest of Mesopotamia didn't last too long. And they built this type of um, walls. For example, this is the Hadrian's Wall in Scotland to protect themselves from the barbarians. Okay. And uh, these are the Roman emperors in the first part, on the first three centuries of the empire. The most famous one, Augustus, which is Octavian, Caligula, Nero, the one who burned Rome, and Titus, who was the one who built the Colosseum, Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius and Commodus, who, which appear in the movie Gladiator, and so on. So, after the height, the decline. The decline during these 4th and 5th centuries, we have some periods of recovery and some periods of crisis, and the barbarians still attacked the Roman boundaries, and it made more difficult to the Romans to control all of their territory. But at the beginning of the 4th century, there was a, a very good emperor, Constantine, who made the city of Byzantium, which was a Greek police, and which is today Istanbul, the capital of the Roman Empire instead of Rome, and he called it Constantinople. Constantinopla, la ciudad de Constantino, vaya. In the year 395 AD, there is also one important event, because the emperor Theodosius, Theodosio, divided the empire definitively into two parts between his children, the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. In the Western Empire, the capital was Rome, the Eastern Empire, the capital was Constantinople. And they were given to Honorius and Arcadius, the two children, the two sons of Theodosius. This is Constantinople, how it would 
look like okay this very very big city and this are uh, this is the division of the roman empire pars occidentalis pars orientis okay constantinople is here and rome is here the red part is the western roman empire and the uh, purple part is the eastern roman empire and these are the invasions of the barbarian people Western Empire, Eastern Empire, and these barbarian people were the Angles, the Saxons, the Franks, Alemanni, Vandals, Visigoths, etc., etc., and they managed to enter the empire. And finally, Rome the fall, fell at the uh, end of the 5th century. And because at the beginning of this century, many of the territories of the uh, Western Empire were invaded by the Germanic tribes, so the Romans had to ally them with this federation pact, the Foedus or Foedi, Foederati se le llamaba. They were allowed to settle in different regions of the Roman Empire in exchange for their military aid against the rest of the barbarians. And finally, one of these Germanic leaders, Odoacer, Odoacro in Castellano, who was a Germanic military leader, de los Erulos, conquered Rome and deposed Romulus Augustulus, which was the last Western Roman Emperor. And this happened in the year 476 AD, in this marked the end of ancient history and the start of the Middle Ages. We have to know this date. So, how Roman cities were. Cities, Rome created a lot of cities all over their territory, all over the coasts of the Mediterranean and the provinces they control. And they were the centers of the economic activity, trade and craft work. Craft work, I mean. The cities were founded and they were organized more or less in the same way on a grid system so the streets in uh, they were intersecting in 90 degrees or lo que hoy llamaríamos una cuadrícula vaya this is that is a grid system the streets were built along straight lines that crossed each other and this design was also used at in the military camps as i did, as i showed you before the roman cities had this is very important had two main streets cardo and the cumanos cardo from north to south the Cumanus from east to west. And where they crossed, there was a large square. This is also very important. I don't know why it is not underlined. The Forum, El Foro. And the Plebeians lived in buildings, in poor buildings with several floors called insulae, islas, los edificios de pisos, with shops and workshops on the ground floor, and the patricians and rich plebeians lived in very comfortable one-story individual family homes called domus, lo que serían los chalets. So, let's see how a Roman city looked like. A grid, cuadrícula, okay, all these terrains are squared, and they have two main streets, cardus, Decumanus, o Cardo and Decumanus, okay? North to south, east to west. In the middle, where they intersect, a big square called the Forum, El Foro, and the main, the most important buildings were located next to the Forum. For example, the Basilica, the temples, and so on, the Curia. And the two types of houses, the domus and the insulae, and all of the city was surrounded by a wall. So, this is how it would look like. Cardo, the Cumanus, north-south, east and west, and the forum in the middle. All of the city was surrounded by a wall. This is a reconstruction of Valencia. ¿Qué es Valencia? Cardo. The Cumanus, Forum, and the Wall. Colonia, Cardo, the Cumanus, and the Forum in the middle, surrounded by a wall. This is a domus, a, um, a house for the rich, for the patricians, as you can see with many rooms, with storages, with vestibules, the impluvium which was this little pool, with gardens, with these uh, living rooms, all very, 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 with very 
luxury, without of luxury. And this is an insula, the house of the poor, which have several floors. And this is a real insula, the remains of the real insula. So the economy, the Roman economy was based on agricultural slavery, the trade and the craft work. In agriculture, they grew cereals, legumes, grapes, olive fruit and vegetables, the normal thing in the Mediterranean. And their production increased because they used new tools and improved techniques, the plows, the mills, the crop rotation and the presses. I will show you some pictures of this. In the craft work, they established their workshops in the cities and they were a great variety of trades, the officios. Metalsmiths, carpenters, tanners, dyers, shoemakers and potters. Just, you have to know just a couple of them. Finally, trade was extremely important in the Roman economy because it, they, it benefited from the Mediterranean Sea routes. Because the, all the coast of the Mediterranean was part of the Roman Empire, the trade flourished a lot. Also because the extensive network of roads, the Roman built a lot of roads throughout all the empire, las calzadas, and the widespread use of coins. They, they took this from the Greeks. So let's see some pictures. This is a Roman farm with the presses and the mills. This is a Roman workshop. Okay, this is a painter and this is a um, marble cutter, I don't know. Okay. This is a Roman merchant ship with sailing between the colonies or between the cities of the Roman Empire. This is, these are Roman coins. This is Imperator Caesar Nervae Traiano Optimo Augustus Germanicus Dacius. This is a golden coin from uh, Trajan. And this is a bronze coin, I think, from the Senate. This is gold mine. The uh, Romans also mined a lot of uh, precious metals all over their territory. This is Rosia Montana, which is in Romania. And these are the roads, the network of roads all uh, in the Roman Empire. As you can see, they built a lot, but a lot, a very, very extensive network of roads roads and this is the uh, roman road nowadays in cercedilla very close to our location here in madrid this is the map of the economic uh, activity in the empire you, you have here the legend and with the trade routes which most of them all led to the city of rome to the capital Epa. the roman religion the roman religion was very similar to the Greek religion. They were polytheistic, they believed in many gods. Here you have the chart of part of their gods. In at the, um, at the left the Greek name, at the right the Roman name. They adopted the um, Greek gods and also the emperor was worshipped. O sea, pensaban que el emperador mismo era un dios y se le divinizaba. And uh, also, they, this is, was for, for the public religion, but inside the houses, they had their own private religion. The manes, the ancestors, the lares, the guardian of the homes, and the penates, the deities who protected the provisions of the households. But later during the empire christianity appeared why because as you may know in the first century AD, a new religion appeared called well christianity based on the teachings of jesus of nazareth jesus christ who was a jew crucified during the emperor tiberius reign and during his life jesus had 12 companions Jesús tuvo doce amigos, el trece debe ser tú, cantaba yo en religión, the apostles, los apóstoles, and some followers, but the problem is Jesus did not leave any kind of writing, so we know about his life and his message by the writings of others, and these are all compiled in a series of books that are part of the Bible called the Gospels, los Evangelios. They are for St. John, St. Mark, St. Matthew and St. Luke. 
The Christians as uh, different from they were different from the Romans because they were monotheist. They believed in only one God, unlike the Romans, and they believed that old men were equal in God's eyes. This is some of the teachings of Jesus Christ. So it was contrary to the concept of slavery and the social inequality. This is why that was common during the Roman time. And that is why the Roman emperors started to persecute the Christians. Why? Because they also, besides all of this, they refused to, uh, to worship the emperor. And some of them were tortured and many of them were killed and they were called the martyrs, los mártires. So the Christians had to meet in secret, usually in the catacombs of Rome, for example, and they use secret symbols, the sepher, the anchors, the feast, the hero, to disguise their message. But even though they were persecuted, they were uh, killed, the Christianity still spread and spread and spread a lot during these centuries. Finally, in the year 313 AD, this is very important, the Emperor Constantine the Great ended this persecution and legalized the Christian religion. And later, in the year 380, Theodosius the Great made Christianity the official religion of empire. So he ended with the previous religion, the paganism. And this is the oldest Bible we know, Codex Sinaiticus. It's written in uh, Greek. And these are some of the, um, the symbols that the Christians use, the anchor and the feces, for example. And also they used the hero, hero is, which is this X and this P, which are the initials of Jesus Christos, which is uh, the anagram of Jesus Christ. And this was used, for example, by Constantine in the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in the seals of his soldiers. And finally, to end, we have to talk about the art. The, as usual, first with the architecture. The Romans built a lot of variety of both civil and religious buildings. Remember that the Greeks, the main buildings were only two, the temples and the theaters. The Roman will build will uh, build these two types of buildings and many others. And what were their common characteristics? The Greek influences, because they used the same architectural order, they, say they use pediments, they use columns, as well as the Greeks. The utility, because all of these buildings were very useful, and the decoration. So, because each building was designed for a specific purpose and they were made larger, because the interior space was more important. And the curved features were used. Remember that the, Greek, all the Greeks only used straight lines and the Romans used both uh, straight and curved lines. So they used a lot of arches and a lot of vaults. If you remember from the Mesopotamia unit, arcos y bóvedas, arches and vaults. And they used poor quality materials, brick and mortar, ladrillo y mortero. But they covered them with marble, so they disguised these kind of materials. The temples were similar, but a bit different uh, compared to the uh, Greek ones. They were built on top of a platform, as you can see, the, pol the podium. This is not a stepped platform as in the Greek temples. Their entrance, they had only one entrance, accessed by a staircase. Okay, here, and part of the peristyle was attached to the temple walls. These parts, for example, the columns are attached to the wall. Okay, and this is the difference. But they use columns, they use the pediment, the entablature, it is it, and the Greek orders. This is a Corinthian order temple, La Maison Carré in Nimes. More examples of temples, Augustus in Pula, Corinthian, look, the podium, the staircase, and the, well, the remains of the attached columns. Uh, the Roman temple in Vic, Corinthian also, and this is a, a special type of temple, the special type of temple, the Pantheon in Rome, the best Roman building in the world. 
Uh, which was made by Marcus Agrippa and is a temple dedicated to all the gods. That is what that is why it's called Pantheon, Corinthian. Well, this is not Corinthian. This is composed, but uh, composite order. Well, uh, Corinthian is okay. Okay, and this is how it looks like with this uh, enormous dome in the inside. Now it is a church. The Romans also built theaters which was free standing okay it was not a, a, they didn't use the slope of the mountain but it was a independent building it was not built into a hillside the seats were built using vaults and the parts were similar to the greek theaters except for a higher stage and a semi-circular orchestra if you want to distinguish between a greek and a roman theater in the Greek theater, the orchestra is circular. In the Roman theater, the orchestra is semi-circular. And this is an exceptional theater, very well preserved in Turkey, in Aspendos. This is, and we have, of course, a very good one, the Roman theater in Merida with this semi-circular orchestra. And then they have amphitheaters, two theaters together, Buildings with a round or oval shape where gladiatorial and animal fights took place and also naval battles, battles the Naumachias. The most famous one is this one, the Roman Colosseum in, well, the Colosseum in Rome, okay? But there are more, la Arena de Verona, la Arena de Nimes, which today is a bullfighting place, and these are gladiatorial fights and Naumachias, naval battles. Then we have the Circus. The Circus is a building with this shape of a big ellipse, which held chariot races, carreras de cuadrigas. The most famous one, the Circus Maximus in Rome, and he, it could accommodate over 100,000 spectators, a lot more than the Santiago Bernabeu, amazing. And this is the Roman Circus of Merida, the remains of the Roman Circus of Merida. And this is a chariot race. Okay, chariot, they were, the um, chariot was pulled by four horses, por eso se llaman cuadrigas, cuatro caballos. The Basilica, it's a building located in the Forum which held trials, judgments and government meetings and could also have stores in its lower part. This is the building that the Christians later used to build their churches because it was it had a lot of interior space to hold or to place the prayers. And this is how it would look like. Look at all of this interior space, Corinthian. The baths. The public baths were used for hygienic purposes, to wash themselves, to clean the people. They had several pools with water with different temperatures, cold, hot and uh, temperate. And in case they were mixed, they had separate parts for men and women. This is the most famous baths, the baths of Caracalla in Rome, the remains of these baths. And this is how they would look like with all that pools. They also built bridges, which are buildings used to cross rivers with arches. Look at these arches. They use these are the curved features, these semicircular arches supported by these pillars. This is the Roman Bridge of Cordoba or the Roman Bridge of Alcantara in Cáceres. Then we have the aqueducts, which are buildings built to carry water. The water was carried here in the upper part to transport water to the city's deposits and they usually have several tiers of arches for example this is the the, the uh, widely known aqueduct of segovia and this is also very famous the pont du Gard in france then we have commemorative buildings they were monuments which commemorated the victories of the emperors and decorated with inscriptions and reliefs of the military victories and the battles and we have two types of commemorative buildings the triumphal arches like this one the arch of constantine and the victory columns the arches were built when the romans came from a victorious military campaign this is the one of constantine next to the colosseum this is the arc of titus in in the forum after he defeated the jews and this is the arch of septimius severus when he defeated the germans in the also in the forum and 
We also have the commemorative columns. In these columns, they were these reliefs which narrated a military campaign. In the case of the Trajan's column, also in the forum, it narrated the conquest of the Dacia. Okay? Now, in Roman culture, the Romans followed the Greek models and they actually copied a lot of Greek sculptures. They, but they made way more. They made portraits of their emperors and their most important individuals. They could be on the horseback, which is equestrian sculpture, sitting, o sea, seated, which is a sitting sculpture, full length, just a stand-up sculpture, and a bust, which depicts only the head and the shoulders. What is the most important feature of the Roman sculpture? The true the true depiction of the subject, with its, its imperfections, with their personality, with their feelings. If the Roman was ugly, he was sculpted ugly, okay? To preserve, this was done to preserve the memory of the subject. And also we have historical reliefs, for example, in the column of Trajan, which reproduce events forming a narrative, as I showed you. So, you can see here, okay? This is very specific individual, Lucius Junius Brutus, the first consul, and this is a patrician. As you can see, he is old and he is depicted as he is old and ugly, okay? They, they didn't aim for the beauty, but they aimed for reality. And these are busts, okay? Or busts, no sé cómo se dice. This is a sitting statue, an equestrian statue, Marcus Aurelius, great emperor. And late, finally, the Roman painting. The Romans painted the walls of the temples and the walls of the houses for decoration. And they had the, se the following characteristics. They were polychrome, used several colors. They painted a variety of subjects of themes, for example, scenes of daily lives, celebrations, religious, mythology, and landscapes. They portrayed also architectural features. They, drawn, they drew columns, they drew arches, they drew buildings, and they used this to create a sensation of real space, a sensation of depth, a sensation of perspective. And also, they used mosaics. Mosaics is a technique of decoration in which, usually um, applied to the floors, in which they embedded small pieces of stone or marble. And these small pieces are called tesserae, las teseras. O, o sea, perdón, las teselas, perdón, en castellano. Into the floor, and they form an image. And they could be a geometric design, or a mythological design, or a scene of daily life, or whatever. There are several, a lot of different subjects. Here, some examples of Roman painting, which are conserved in Pompeii after the eruption of the Vesuvius. For example, here you can see daily life, and architectural features, and more architectural features, and part of the daily life looked at, um, take into account that they used several colors, okay? And this, it makes you the sensation of depth, okay? Sensación de profundidad, de perspectiva. More examples inside the, the Domus. And these are mosaics, okay? This is Neptune, by the way. And as you can see, this, each one of these small pieces are called tesserae, teselas. And they um, glued uh, each piece of little mosaic or little tesseras, and they formed these kind of images. Here you have some examples. Cabe canem, cuidado con el perro, beware of the dog. And this is Neptune again. And this is this is in this uh, this mosaic uh, is in Spain, if I am correct. And finally, the Romanization. Romanization means living the Roman way, which is the process that all of the peoples that were conquered by the Roman army suffered because they adopted the Roman costumes, the Roman way of life. The most important features are 
the Latin, they started using the Latin language, the Roman calendar, which lasted at first 355, later 365 days, they are called the Julian calendar, and the Roman law, el derecho romano. It is one of the most important contributions to the, from the Romans to the Western civilizations. Even nowadays, if you go for law studies, you will have to study the Roman law. And they, well, first time they distinguished between public law and the private law, relations between citizens and the state and between citizens themselves, and is the basis of many modern law systems, including the Spanish law system. So, this is the Latin language. This is part of the Velo Gallico by Julius Caesar, La Guerra de las Galias. Gallia est omnis divisa in partes tres, quarum unan in columnt belgae, aliam aquitani tertian, quipsorum lingua celtiae nostra galli appellantur. A magnificent book. This is a Roman calendar with the 12 months. Januarius, Februarius, Martias, Aprilis, Maias, Junius, Quintilis, Sextilis, Septilis, Octobris, Novili, Decembrie. And the last month, the intercalar. Well, and this is a Roman law. The Roman law were usually inscribed in bronze and they were um, exposed in public places so everyone could read them. And finish the end. Ya por fin hemos terminado. Ese es Julio César con la décima legión que era una de sus favoritas. Bueno, pues, ostras, se está haciendo de noche, madre mía. Qué tarde, pero qué tarde es. Con esto hemos terminado ya la última lección. Nos quedaría un pequeño apéndice que lo voy a hacer en otro, en otro vídeo muy cortito sobre la Hispania romana. ¿Vale? Así que 52 minutazos de vídeo. Te cagas. Muchas gracias por haber visto este vídeo. Cualquier duda, preguntadmela, ya sabéis. No os cortéis y nos vemos en el último vídeo del curso, que será el próximo. Adiós.